Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, the third Kala speaker series this year. Um, let's give it one or two minutes for more attendees to join us. All right, thanks everyone. Um, a warm welcome to the third session, um, third session of Kala Speaker Series, a fusion of tradition and more modernity, um, Chinese publishing the late 19th and early 20th centuries, presented by the Wikidata Chinese Culture Heritage Group in partnership with Colossus in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Chinese American Librarians Association. Our guest speaker today is Hai Ching Lin, Head of Technical Services from University of California, Berkeley. My name is Greta Helm, um, the Cataloging and Metadata Strategies Librarian at San Diego State University. I'm the coordinator of today's webinar. Before we get started, um, let's get to know the groups that planned and supported today's webinar. I'm a member of Wikidata Chinese Cultural Heritage Group. Our Wikidata groups proposed and planned this event. We were formed in October 2020 with Chinese American librarians from several institutions. Our group has done multiple projects and presented our findings about characteristics of Wikidata related to Chinese cultural heritage, data models for um, Chinese women points, um, and historical places in different data visualizations. Sally Lee, head of content support services at University of California Davis is our group leader who is also here today. You can find more information about our group works on our Wikidata page. I'll drop the link in the chat later. Um, today um, is the third it's the third event of our um, speaker series supported by Kala, since 1973, the Chinese American Librarians Association is a leading organization supporting diversity and equity in the library profession. We appreciate Kala's support for this event. The slides and recording of today's event will be uploaded to Kala's as the Kalas Institution Repository. Kalas hosts um, scholar works and educational materials from its members and library professionals in the library and information science field. And it also archives Kalas official documents, conference materials, and Chinese cultural heritage collections. Today, we're thrilled to have Hai Ching Lin, the Head of Technical Services at CV Star East Asian Library, University of California, Berkeley, as our guest speaker. Before joining to Berkeley, Hai Ching was the Asian Studies Librarian and Chinese Resources Librarian at the University of, of Auckland Library, New Zealand. Chinese rare books have been the, the subject of his research as well as the application of cutting edge technologies in the field of Chinese rare books, including leaked data and machine learning. We encourage you to actively participate in the discussion and ask questions. 
you can use the chat function or Q&A function to post your questions, and we will try to address as many as possible during the Q&A session after Haiqing's talk. Let's begin, Haiqing. Please take it over. I think you're muted. <laughs> okay, thank you for uh, introducing me. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, have a talk here and discuss the uh, Chinese red book, particularly the three modern uh, Chinese books published in late 19th century and early 20th centuries. And the linked data project is very interesting uh, linked data project. But uh, this talk was not related, uh, directly related to the linked data. But uh, my understanding is if we better understand the materials and the would benefit for us to do the linked data, particularly the modeling of the materials. So uh, yeah, so this talk will focus on the um, materials itself. When we, uh, start talking about the topics. I think the Chinese red book is very big uh, area and uh, it's very difficult to uh, discuss just within the short times. And in particular, the Chinese red book always a small, um, small collection in the East Asian library and the people may not uh, see a lot of Chinese red books um, in their daily times. But in other side, if the pre-modern Chinese books um, in the later 19th century or early 20th centuries, it's much bigger and more dramatically um, important for the scholars. So I put my focus on this time period. As we know, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century will be the uh, significant uh, transformation time period in China history. Uh, after um, 1840s, Opinion War, China society began to transform from the traditional to modern. The most important thing we can see is the Western culture came to China. So there's a lot of conflict with the China traditional and the Western culture, but also these two cultures uh, meet together to ch entirely change the China society. So there's a lot of the forces driven the China changes, also driven the revolutionary development of publications uh, in that time period, which is um, a just of a new publication institutions and uh, the contents of the publications is changed and diversity of the publications formats and also the uh, technologies and new publishing technologies. So entirely change it, fundamentally change. Um, if we look at uh, the materials published in this time period compared to the books, the so-called traditional red book, it's big difference. So this talk will focus on this. I try to give the uh, big picture of this publication's time period. Um, but unfortunately, we are not able to discuss everything. Um, this talk will focus on the four uh, aspects. First of all, is missionary press. Missionary publication will be the main features of this time period and a significant change. The publishing industry in China also changed the China society. And also, Taiping Tiangu. And this is uh, the big um, so social uh, event in China. And it, it was also impacted 
significantly in China uh, print uh, industry. And also we, we look at the significant, uh, even in the self-strength movement, Yang Wu Yun Dong, it also uh, learn a lot of Western knowledge, obviously uh, reflected into the Chinese publications. And the last topic, probably we are talking about the constitutional uh, reforms in the late 19th century, early 20th centuries, which also affect the China publications, particularly the Chinese government publications. So I try to discuss these four topics and try to give the, uh, the, the pictures of the Chinese publication in that time period. So first of all, we are talking about the uh, Chinese missionary publications. Before the Opium War, uh, Christian was banned in China. So they are not allowed um, Western people come to China to uh, preach the Christian religions in China. So the Western people missionary only can publish the Christian materials outside of China, particularly in um, Malaysia, Indonesia, or Mal Malacca, uh, Malaysia, uh, that area. So here is the example of the books which in our library uh, the published in 1826. Actually, this book is published in Malaysia, um, Malacca, it's in Malaysia. Um, there's a note, said the book is published there. It looks like a Chinese uh, books and it's wood block publishing, but actually printed and uh, published in outside of the China. So after Opium War, there's a, a treatment with the Nanjing treat, uh, Treaty and the particular Wangsha Treaty. And the uh, Christian allowed um, to enter the China in five ports, um, five Kaifang Kwan. So they started establishing the publishing house in China to print the missionary materials. The first Chinese, um, missionary material, uh, publishing house was established in 1843, uh, which is a missionary we call the uh, Meadows, moved to the uh, from the uh, London. He moved his publisher press in. Uh, Yakata to Shanghai, uh, named as the London Missionary Society Press. Uh, in Chinese terms, the Mo Hai Su Guan. This is the image is the, the, the books published by the Mo Hai, uh, Mo Hai Su Guan. It was the first modern uh, publisher house in China. The print method basically is uh, use the movable type printing. They imported the print machines to China and the print the mat uh, machinery materials. So this is an example. And the second uh, important uh, machinery press will be the uh, Mei Hua Su Guan. Mei Hua Su Guan established in 1844 which is the uh, American churches uh, established called the Chinese and American Holy Classic Books Establishment in Macau. And then they moved to uh, mainland of China to uh, located to Ningbo in Zhejiang province. And the two years later, they moved to Shanghai. And the Mei Hua Su Guan is the uh, that become the largest uh, missionary, pub, missionary press in China at that time. And it become the very important uh, mission, Christian uh, materials 
uh, applications agent in that time. This public house is have a very significant contribution to China in the uh, public industry. The two things: one is they innovated a uh, Chinese uh, mobile types. As we know, traditional Chinese uh, prints use the wood block, which is the uh, the entire block and. Uh, uh, people eat it on the block, block and the print. And uh, traditionally, we also innovated the, uh, the wood mobile types, but it's not used quite often. But once the uh, Christian uh, come to China, they start to use the, the, the traditionally, the Western print method, they use the uh, letters, each letters. So it's mobiles. So they bring this idea into China as well. And then they uh, innovated uh, Chinese uh, types, mobile types. Um, so, Hai Hua Su Guan make a great contribution to this. And they uh, developed the, uh, seven sides of the Chinese font. Uh, now, currently, uh, China industry still use that uh, size as a standard. They, um, they also innovated a type of case. The, this is image is the example, the, the type of case. So it make people can easily to locate the Chinese characters. Chinese character is different with English um, or other uh, Latin languages. Uh, we based on the characters, each characters. So um, mobile types will be more than 10,000 characters. So how to locate the types is the challenge. So they developed the method uh, type of case to help people to uh, loc uh, locate the characters easily. So this also the uh, standard, long-term standard for Chinese publications. So this is a very significant contribution to the Chinese publications. And once the missionary come to the China, they also bring the, uh, the new technologies, uh, print technologies. And the particular I'm I want to mention here is uh, this lithographic uh, publication uh, print method. During the late uh, during the late nineteenth centuries, and the Lithographic publication uh, print method will be the mainstream of the publishing in China. And also lead a lot of the Chinese uh, commercial publications companies. Why the lithographics come to China? Um, it comes from the uh, missionary. When they think of the establish the uh, missionary pub, uh, press in China, um, they will think of the cost of the uh, of the publisher. So the people compare the different type of the uh, print method. So there's a three major method. One is a typographic method, and it's much higher. So. This is very high. And the traditional Chinese block printing. It's also very high. And the cheapest one is a lithographic print. So they think that the lithographic print is cheaper. So they start to bring the lithographic method into China. But actually, there's a mis misunderstanding of the wood block printing why uh, water block printing is much higher, uh, most higher than the uh, Western method. This, uh, this is tricky because the, um, the Western people hire a Chinese uh, water block worker to, uh, 
to make a print. But uh, as we know, the Christian was banned in China. It is kind of the illegal works. And also it's risky. So they have to pay a much higher prices for what the, the block. Uh, if for the, in the China, if we printed the traditional Chinese materials, the price would not be such high. So that's the, um, you know, this very special situation. This is a um, kind of misleading of the uh, the prices of wood plant, but uh, this bring the new technology into China. So Chinese people also use this method to print a lot of the traditional Chinese uh, text as well. So here is an example. Um, it is a very this is a very small uh, box. You see it's. This is my glasses. It's a very small one. Um, can you see this? Uh, the text in here. They said, "Oh, this is because the small small box to facilitate you bring the travel for travel. Please don't go bring this into the uh, national exam for cheating. But actually, the purpose of this is for that." But as they mentioned, please don't do this. So, because the uh, lesser graphics, they can easily to uh, make the book smaller and enlarge the size of the book. So, a lot of the Chinese publish also use these technologies to print the book, particular for uh, culture culture, which is national exam, uh, civic exam. And also, the once uh, Christian come to China, uh, they publish a lot of the books. Not only the uh, religions, Christian uh, contents, but also the science and history. A lot of a uh, wide range of the contents. Here is the Mei Hua Su Guan, the the catalog of the Mei Hua Su Guan. You can see there's a lot of the different kind of the books they publish. They also included uh, the, um, for example, the here is the politics, political science. And this is the uh, history, right? And also the newspapers. They also bring the newspapers, uh, the full into China. And this technologies talking about the machine. So it's not just the, the, uh, the religion contents, but also the science and others. They also publish a lot of the traditional Chinese uh, contents, uh, such as the Yuanjing. Uh, this is the traditional Chinese contents. So I mentioned here, so this is an example of the Meihua Su Guan, uh, published in 1812. Uh, which is Yu Er Zhen Yan is a Christian contents. Please read um, read the contents here. They translated um, Western literature into China, and they use very special languages to translate the contents. They also use uh, uh, translate the as a dialect Longchang. It's the Fuzhou Fuzhou dialect. They also translate. Uh, they also publish the Lun Yu, very Chinese tradition. But what's the difference with the missionary publication with the Chinese tradition? Please read the the translation they they did. They said the Kung Fu Zi Xue Shuo. Kind of, I'm sorry. Um, they use a very uh, daring vernacular. It's not a classic Chinese text. 
and particularly in the preface, they talk about why they use vernacular rather than classic Chinese text. And the, uh, the idea would be if the people use the vernacular, they can easily communicate with the uh, general people, not the scholar elites. So that's their purpose, which is very different with the traditional publications in China. This is also the Hai Mo Su Guan published uh, the Western novels. They also use the vernacular, Bai Hua Wen, uh, talking about uh, translated into Bai Hua Wen. If you read the text, it's easily, you can see it's a Bai Hua Wen. And it's very interesting. We are talking about the Chinese Bai Hua Wen movement. Uh, we always talking about the Baihua start from the Wu Si Yun Dong, um, um, led by the Hu Shi. But actually, before Wu Shi, long before Wu Si Yun Dong, there's a Baihua Wen as, uh, publication as well, which is uh, produced by a uh, uh, Western missionary. So if uh, if we look at the missionary and materials, we will think of the China. Bai Hua Yun Dong will be much earlier than Wu Si Yun Dong. They also published a lot of the uh, science uh, books translated from uh, uh, Western book. You also read this text. You can see they translated the science into classic Chinese. Uh, this is a classic Chinese. Wen Yan Wen. So let's, let's just think of the, the Wen Yan Wen also can represent the science content. History. Um, they publish a lot of the Western history. This is the history of the British history and also translated into Wen Yan Wen. So we, we can see there's a two, two trends. Once the missionary people, they translate the Chinese classic into vernacular, make the ordinary people can understand. But they also translated the Western literature into classic Chinese. You know, these two directions will be the very interesting. And then the mission also translated a lot of the uh, medicine books. This, I, this book is very interesting. I, I want to particularly mention here is, you see there's a lot of the illustrations and it was very detailed. You look like the Western styles and um, it's hardly to find in Chinese traditional books. But when you read this preface, they said this block is made in America, not in China. So this is, uh, um, you can see here, uh, these plants made in Philadelphia, America. So they, these plants made in America and bring to China, insert into the Chinese wood block, print the Chinese books. This is a very special uh, printer method combined across the Specifications, right? This America and China uh, work together to make the book. So this is the um, particular translation movement in China. We call the um, Sangwu Yin Su Guan, or not some sorry, not some. Zhangnan Su Ju. Uh, which is led by a uh, uh, friar, John Friar. We have a very good collection, uh, his translation. He translated about 106 titles of the Western science and technology books into China. This is a very significant uh, translation movement. And the, we can say it is start of the Chinese science and uh, and the technology studies.
So this is the, the missionary contribution to the Chinese publications. They bring the new technologies, they bring the new forms of the text. They also bring the new technology knowledges from uh, Western to China. So uh, when we're talking about the Chinese publications in that time period, um, we, have, we cannot uh, avoid the missionary publications in that time. And the second effect of the change will be the uh, official local official print houses, establishment of the lo local official uh, print houses. Um, as we know, um, in, in the late 19th centuries, this uh, uh, huge uh, social disaster in China, which called the Taiping Tianguo. Uh, the Taiping Tianguo, um, they so called it uh, Christian. They use a Christian, uh, Christian talk. It's not real Christian, but they, they use the Christian terms. And they classify the Chinese traditional Confucianism as an evil book. So they burn a lot of the books. Um, the people cannot just. Uh, keep the traditional uh, Confucius books and they cannot sell them, they cannot collect them, so they just burn it. So after the Taiping Tianguo, in many, many provinces, people are not able to find the book, a Confucius book. Um, here is the uh, Zhou Zhe, which is uh, Tong Zhe Liu Nian, um, 18th 67, uh, the so-called Bao Yuan, he gave the uh, emperor, he, he, he sent a letter to the emperor said, uh, in Jiangnan, which is uh, Jiangsu province, Shanghai, Jiangxi, or Zhejiang, this area, because the uh, Taiping Tianguo, people cannot find, find the book, or the book is burned. And um, even the uh, book collection in schools, government, or is gone. So he asked the emperor to allow the people reprint the book from the uh, emperor's collections. So this is the total. It's very difficult to translate into uh, English, but uh, yeah, the meaning is like this. So this image is an example. And the emperor said, yes, agree with that and ask all the uh, provincial uh, government to reprint the book from the central government. So this is the Zhou Zhe, which is the established the Jiangxi Suju. Uh, tell the emperor why we need to establish the Jiangxi Suju, which is a local official print house. Um, in, traditionally, uh, in, in China, uh, Local government don't have the publishing house. Only the central government has a publishing house. And uh, usually they publish some of the uh, books by the government itself, but they, have, they don't have the special uh, publishing house. But after the Taiping Tianguo, uh, many uh, provinces establish their own official uh, government owned publishing house. So here is the, uh, the how the Taiping Tianguo related to the establishment of local official publishing house. The red is the area of the Taiping Tianguo area. And after that, all the publishing house, all the province established the publishing house to reprint the Confucius books. So this is an example of the uh, local, the book published by the uh, local publishing house. We call Zhejiang Suju, which is a province, uh, Zhejiang province local uh, official print house, and the Jiangnan Suju, which in Nanjing.
the local the local uh, official print house make a significant contribution to uh, to China restore the Chinese traditions. They publish a lot of uh, uh, traditional contents, particularly the 24 house, 24 histories. But Arsusi, you know, Chinese tradition, each uh, dynasty have to publish the official um, dynasty house uh, history before uh, the early dynasty. So in China, and due to the Qing dynasty, there's a 24 dynasties. So each dynasty has the official uh, history. After the uh, Taiping Tianguo and the local government, local five local um, publisher houses work together to reprint the 24 uh, history. These five um, local print houses will be the Jinling, Huainan, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, and Hubei, uh, Suju, they call it Hubei Suju. This is an example of the, um, the one of the history book. So we call this book Jiben, uh, which is the, uh, the printed by uh, official printed houses. Because the Jiben, they can employ a lot of the scholars working hard on the correct the contents. So they, they have very uh, good uh, contents. Another example is they did the Wuyin Dian Zhu Zheng Ban. They participate in the Wuyin Dian Zhu Zheng Ban. Wuyin Dian Zhu Zheng Ban is Wuyin Dian, which is the central government print house, and also the emperor libraries. They have a lot of the, they have the huge collections and they also printed the books. We choose them with some mobile type prints. So mobile type prints uh, in Wintian um, produced in Qianlong, which is much earlier than uh, the time period we are talking about. And after, after Taiping Tianguo, uh, people asking to reprint the Wintian Zhu Zhengben, which is a uh, Jiangxi Suju and uh, Wangya Suju, which is in Guangzhou. They participate, reprint the Zhu Zhengben Suju. What's the mobile type print and the word block? They, they use a word block to print the Zhu Zhengben books. What's the different of the uh, Zhu Zhengben books, which are mobile type books and uh, uh, block? Because the mobile type of um, books, once the book is printed, the mobile type, the block will be destroyed and reorganized for other books. So we don't have the physical book block for that book. So just one time printing. But if the word block, the block is always there. We can print multiple times. So they, uh, the, so the Jiangxi Suju or and the Guangya Suju, they think the mobile type is not convenient because it's not easy to print more times. So they convert to the um, mobile types block into the word block. Um, that's the big change uh, for for those kind of books. And another significant uh, development of the China uh, publications was the political gazetteers. Uh, before we discuss about the uh, Chinese official uh, publisher house, they publish the book. It is not for publishing the government document. They publish the literature uh, publish a class, Chinese classics for the education purpose. But in the early 19th century, early 20th centuries, 
uh, there's a big movement, we so-called uh, constitutional reform. Uh, we call this, in Chinese terms, we say li xian yun dong. They, they, try, they try to establish the Western uh, political systems, uh, particular administration systems. So for that purpose, they publish uh, news, newspaper, daily report to issue uh, political and the government document, particular uh, like uh, emperor's edits, memories, telegraphs, law, regulations, everything. It is like it. Now, we currently we have uh, the government publishing house. They publish all the government documents uh, in China in 19, 1907. They also have the, such the publications. They call the Zheng Zhi Guan Bao. Now, here is the example of the Zheng Zhi, Zheng Zhi Guan Bao. You can see they have the Zhou Zhe. Um, they also have the um, news, which is a particular the news from the outside of China, uh, international news. And then they have the special establishment of the Xian uh, which is the exam of the uh, constitutional documents. Like America, we have the government publishing uh, publication houses. It's a similar, uh, which is Xian Zheng Bian Cha Guan, and they publish it. It's, this is a central government, uh, government publishing house. And then this is an example of the local, uh, local government, provincial government. This is the uh, Nanyang Guan Bao, which is the uh, Liangchang Zongdu in Jiangsu and the Jiangxi province. They also publish the government um, report. This is the format of the, uh, the Guan Bao. So the Guan Bao is a very uh, significant change, both in China political development and uh, also the publications. For the publication perspective, they have the, uh, that means the, the government issued the newspapers. And for the, from the um, political perspective, we can see this modern political, uh, it's part of the modern political system. And also, this is a very interesting. I found in this newspapers, newspaper articles in the Washington, uh, Washington Post in 1907. They said the new Chinese innovations, talking about uh, the China publishing the political uh, newspapers. And they said um, it's so much upon the wider world president of the United States. It's much earlier uh, than the American published the public, uh, government publications. Uh, American president has idea to establish the kind of the newspapers, but they just think they didn't uh, make it happen. But the China, Qing government, they did. So they, these are newspapers, uh, American people just the surprise said, oh, China is good, advanced than uh, the American. Yeah, that's the very interesting. It surprised me. I just haven't found this, these articles and it is very interesting. Um, yeah, I tried to mention here. So we are talking about the um, the some development in late nineteenth centuries and the twentieth centuries. You can see it's various for of the publications in, at that times. 
and it's very complicated when we deal with the uh, Chinese books in that time period. Different format, there's a modern and the tradition, the contents also varies with modern and the tradition. Um, it is uh, sometimes a challenge for the librarian to deal with those kind of materials. I just bring here to uh, for attention uh, some challenges we may have. For example, how to classify the books which are published by, uh, uh, for example, the missionary materials. Uh, for example, the for the science materials we have mathematics and the traditional we have the Suan Su. Uh, what's different with the Suan Su and the mathematics, and also Chinese tradition we have Yi Su how to compare to the medical books from, from Western. Um, can we just use the Chinese traditional classification system to classify the Western books? Uh, that's the question. Uh, currently, the solution is we establish a new classification system we call the Xinxue, and particularly classify the books published during the late 19th century and the early 20th centuries. Um, we are not able to use a traditional flavor to classify those kind of books. Secondary, the challenge for us is determine the print mass. Uh, we, let's go back to this book, for example. There's a multiple print method. You see, this book, it looks like uh, the, the format is similar with the Chinese traditional wood block, but actually it is not. It is the uh, mobile types print. So it become the challenges for the librarians to determine what's the uh, print method. Why is the print method important? As we said, mobile type, just one time print, but Word block, we can print many, many times. So addition, the meaning of the addition will be the different. And this is another example is the, uh, yeah, Shinbun, Lesio graphic uh, prints. So it also looks like the Chinese traditional prints, but actually it's not. Um, so it will be the very uh, the challenges for the librarians to determine what is the print method. And the last the challenge we may have is um, print publishing date. It's very special when we catalog, when we catalog in the uh, rare Chinese books, Sometimes it's much easier to determine the publishing date than the book published in late 19th centuries. Um, there's some reasons. For example, they, they reprint a lot of the Chinese classics and they make an, uh, no any changes. So the books looks like the published before uh, before channel, which we call the real Chinese books, but actually published quite later. Uh, so if you determine the published data by the preface, will be the big mistake. So it will be the challenge for uh, catalogers or librarians to determine the publishing date. Um, sometimes we will spend more time to determine when the book will be published. So, because it's a, a very short time, so I just want to give the some time to, for a uh, question. So, all the premature will cover this. So, we, we think of the, the, the publication in uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. We have a particular, we have a special institutional arrangement for the publishing. We have the new published 
uh, institutions like a missionary publisher, government, uh, local government publisher houses, and also a lot of the commercial publisher houses, which is much different with the traditional we call the SUFA. So the institutional arrangement is changed. And the content will change. The traditional contents, we also keep the traditional content, but also have the Western content. The print technology is changed. It's no longer just the, the wood block, but also the Western modern uh, print technologies like uh, multiple types uh, prints or um, less lithographic prints. And also, most importantly, we have uh, different forms of the written systems, not just the classic Bai Hua uh, Wen Yan Wen, but also the Bai Hua Wen um, become the important parts of the publications. So that's all I uh, today I prepared. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Hetsin, for the great presentation. This is a very informative talk. Um, we'll now take some time for questions. To ask questions, um, please click the Q&A button and type in your questions. We, um, I think I have a question already. Um, so Haiching, you talked about the missionary press influence on Chinese publishing and publication and also some low kind of local official print houses. I'm curious if there are any unofficial local print houses in China that you are aware of. And did the did they follow the same publishing standards where there are mixed use of different publishing method and what are the challenging uh, challenges um, for cataloging those kind of books? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a various uh, publication uh, systems in China at that time. Uh, as we said, the, the, the uh, local government publisher and uh, missionary publishing, it's well formatted uh, materials. Uh, for example, the here, This is this is a missionary publications is well, well formatted. You can get the publishing date and uh, from the book, and also the um, this is the the local government publications. They also formatted. You also can get the date, uh, who, who the publishers, and this, all the information for catalogs. But uh, they also have a lot of the books, which is the um, just a general people publish it. I give you an example here. This is the book without any publication date or who is the publisher or who look, even who looked in the book. This is just a people um, ordinary print something. Uh, also the mixed. So it is a mixed, it's, it's various. Um, I didn't cover them with this it, because it's too complicated. Um, yeah, so uh, cataloging the books in that time period is more challenging. Uh, I'm wondering if those kind of different ways of publishing or publication um, gets more consistent and standard after the Ming War or still um, the different ways continues to mingle. Yes, um, actually, uh, catalog, from catalog perspective, um, Mingguo, early Mingguo is still a uh, challenge. Um, also have the multiple format. For example, early Mingguo, we, we still have uh, traditional uh, bonding styles and also the uh, modern bonding styles. Publishing information on the book also depend on the uh, publisher house. Some publisher houses, they have a clear uh, information about the book, but some is not. So for cataloging those kind of books, we have to rely on a lot of the book catalogs, which are published by the publisher. 
Um, so that that's the that's the challenge. Thank you so much. Um, we got a question. Um, is the publishing in the late 19th and early 20th century considered modern publishing? What are the major differences between this type of publishing and contemporary publishing? Did the public or publisher then have a have a sense of copyright? Um, yeah, it's very, very interesting questions. And then this time period is a transition time period. So we have the traditional format. We also have the so-called semi-modern format. For example, uh, a lot of the missionary uh, publications, they try to follow the Chinese traditional format. As I mentioned here, you see, they try to make it looks like a Chinese tradition uh, book. Actually, the content itself is from the Western. So for those kind of books, we can easily follow the Chinese rebel catalog and rules to extract the information from the book. And there are some books, you see, this is a very well formatted materials completed the Western modern styles. And then you can see the, even the date, they use the Western calendars as well, not only the Chinese traditional calendars. Uh, so this is a various. So it's hard to say this book is a modern, this book is a tradition. In terms of the contents and the format, uh, so various. If we, in terms of the contents, some books, for example, the science and the technologies, we can think of the, uh, consider as the modern content, but with the traditional format. But the some uh, this book, this content itself is a traditional, but the format is modern. Yeah, so that's the the challenges. For example, uh, we think of the classification, uh, how to classify this book as well as the uh, modern uh, contents of the book. A described format, we have to use the traditional uh, format described as a traditional format, but the contents, we have to use modern content to describe the topic. So it is mixed, right? And also in terms of the uh, copyright, the copyright in China, uh, in that time period, we don't have uh, uh, established copyright uh, laws, but uh, each box, sometimes if we have the Paiji, we call the Paiji, said, oh, we don't allow the reprint. So this is also the, a statement of the copyright. But uh, now we just are following the uh, current uh, copyright legislations to determine this book has a, catalog, a copyright or not. Thank you. Um, and another question we have is how to identify different printing method used for individual items? Yeah, it is a, it is such a challenges. Um, the way is uh, some some tips you can identify the print method. For example, for this one, yeah, it is very clear. They said it's a, it's a lithographic print. It's called Shin. But for these images, you can see um, because lithographic print is a chemical print, so you can see it's very clear it's different with the wood block, right? For this one. And also uh, mobile types. Yeah, you can see this is the mobile types, just the, the you, you see this part. Can you see this one? 
and this is the gap between the two frames. Usually, it's the uh, mobile mobile types uh, prints. All the block we don't have such the gap. Yeah, this one we don't have the each don't have the gap. Yeah, it it is hard to say, but uh, if you see the more books, you can understand. Thank you, Haqing. I think I, I learned a lot from um, your talk, and I feel like um, our attendees also have the same feelings. Um, I would like to thank you, you all for your participation and engagement throughout the webinar. Um, we're already one minute over the time. Um, well, in the end, I would like to announce that we will have the next webinar coming on May 17th. Professor Gris S. Fong, Professor of Chinese Literature in the Department of East Asian Studies at McGill University, will be our next speaker. Um, she will introduce Mingxing Women's Writings, Digital Archive, and Database Project. She will focus on, um, like, discuss how the database can be used to fit various research goals, share her future plans for this project, and explain how to contribute to this database in her talk. Um, Thank you, Haiji, and thank you all for joining us today. Slides and recordings will be available on Colossus soon. We hope you found this webinar informative and valuable. Have a great day. We'll see you in the next web webinar. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.